For chapter three, we're going to be going through a number of periodic trends as well as how to deal with electron orbitals and figuring out where the electrons in our different atoms are and how many of them there are. So to do this for all the questions here, you're going to need to have a periodic table with you. So make sure you have one available so you know what I'm talking about, what I mentioned, how different atoms compare in positions to others. So let's start with the periodic trends portion. There we go. For periodic trends, what we want to do is we want to be able to make a comparison based on the position on the periodic table about the properties of our molecule. So we're going to look at each of these. So we're going to start with highest ionization energy. So remember the general trend is starting at the bottom left and going towards the upper right. You have increase, I ah, erased on me. There we go. We have an increasing ionization energy as you go towards the upper right, suggesting that fluorine is going to have a very high ionization energy. Whereas if you go towards the bottom left for an atom like francium, FR, it's going to have a very low ionization energy. So we want to look at the position of the atoms in our series and decide which one would be the would be towards the upper right. So first you have to locate where oxygen, phosphorus, silicon, and SE, where all four of these atoms are. They're towards the right side of the periodic table. You'll find them all inside the P block. And if you compare their positions, we'll start with oxygen. If we compare it to, to P, our O is higher up. We can then compare it to our SI, it's still higher up, which means it's got a higher ionization energy, and we're comparing it to SE, it's also above that one. So in this case, all oxygen is towards the up and right part of our periodic table, more so than the rest of these atoms, meaning that we're going to say it has the highest ionization energy. Remember that definitionally, that means it's going to take the most energy to remove the first, the first electron from oxygen. So removing a single electron from oxygen will take more energy than it will from any of the other atoms in that series. So we'll look at our second property. This time we're going to look for our largest atom. So we're going to compare the atomic radius of these atoms. Remember that for atomic radius, it goes in the opposite direction. So we get really large as we go towards the bottom and the left. So this is where our larger radius atoms are. Remember that this is related to the fact that one, you're adding additional electron shells as you go further down. And as you go towards the left side of the periodic table, you are going to be able to have a weaker effective nuclear charge, meaning you're not pulling those same electrons in as tightly, making your atom larger. Make sure you understand both those different concepts for explaining your larger radius. So if we take these four atoms, we have fluorine is located in our upper right. We're then gonna find our sulfur, so you're right below there, and as we grab the other atoms in the series, AS is our furthest down to the left, and then O is our highest atom. So that means we're going to go with this as being our largest atom, because it is down and to the left of what we were looking for. Okay, so that gives us, those first two were about looking at our periodic table to figure this out. For our third one, though, we'll use the periodic table to find our ionization energies. I mean, to find our electron configurations, but it's not going to be the only thing we have to look at to determine where our trend's going to go. So we have an isoelectronic series. So first we want to check and make sure that it is isoelectronic in case you weren't told that it was. You might just be told to find the largest species in the series. So to show that it's isoelectronic, we could count the number of electrons in each, at each atom or ion, and if we get the same number of electrons, that's what we mean by isoelectronic. We just mean same number of electrons. So if we check sulfur, starts at 16 electrons. So if we add two more, we'll get it to 18. And remember, I add because I have a negative charge and electrons are negatively charged. So as it becomes negatively charged, we gain, even though it's a minus sign. Chlorine starts at 17. So with one additional electron, it goes to 18. Argon's at 18. Potassium was at 19, but it lost one. And then calcium was at 20, but it lost one. So indeed, this is an isoelectronic series. That means it has the exact same number of electrons for all of these. So we can't use the explanation we used in our previous question about large data in the same way because now the electrons are the same. So we're not worried about that number. The only change here then is going to be the number of protons. That means that in this case, that my, my pointer disappeared, here we go, that my S2 minus, so my sulfide ion is going to be my largest. This is because it's going to have the fewest protons pulling on these electrons. It has fewer protons than the other atoms. So it's going to have a, I mean, it's going to have the weakest effective nuclear charge distribution for each, ele each of these electrons that's able to get out. For our last question, 
we have another trend we're going to look at, and this is going to be our electronegativity trend. So for this one, we're going to go towards the up and right again, and that is going to be increasing electronegativity. As a reminder, electronegativity is related to how well an atom is gonna hold on to electrons when it forms a bond with another atom. So if something has a high electronegativity, it means it's going to more, it's going to hold, have the electrons more. It's going to more easily hold on to them, which means you'll expect a higher electron density compared to an atom with a lower electronegativity if they're sharing a bond together. And this is how, remember also, you're going to, need to look at this when you're working through polarity towards some of the, late, one of the later chapters. Now for this particular case, we can find that CS, or cesium, is going to appear in the bottom left. So it's going to have a very low electronegativity. Copper is going to appear in our transition metal section. And then we find phosphorus and oxygen are both in our nonmetal section, very close to our to fluorine and towards our more, electro, our more electronegative atoms. And in particular, in this case, oxygen is towards the furthest right and up compared to all the rest of these, which means that out of this series, oxygen is going to be our most electronegative atom. So it should hold on to electrons the best out of all of these when it tries to form a bond. Now, so far, we've been looking at just the trends, let's look at now how we're going to talk about where electrons actually go when we write these. From previous chapters, we've been dealing primarily with just a single electron system. When we talked about something like hydrogen and we used those equations to figure out where it would get excited to and what energy was going to be emitted when it got released back down, those were all with one electron systems. That was because our, that our energy levels, as long as we do the principal quantum number, were what we called degenerate. There wasn't a difference based on anything other than n. Once we get to multi-electron systems, though, we now have to deal with energy level splitting so that things like S and P orbitals within the same principal quantum number actually have different energies. So now we've got to figure out where they're going to be located at. So for oxygen, we first want to note, before we try to draw an electron filling diagram, we're going to note what the actual electron configuration is. So oxygen contains a total of eight electrons, which means we're going to have to fill them in order. Remember that the 1s orbital comes first, and all s orbitals can fit two electrons, so that's our first two. We then go our 2s fills next. It can also fit two electrons, so we've now used up four. And we have four remaining, and our next orbital was our 2p orbital, and that'll be 2p4, because we can't fill it up all the way to six since we would run out of electrons. So now we need to draw a picture of what these would look like for an electron filling diagram. So first, for arrow here, and this is going to represent the energy of the orbital, with the idea being that our orbitals that we fill first are lower in energy. That's why they get filled first. So our 1s is just going to have the single blank. And since there are two electrons, we put one spin up and one spin down. Similarly, we'll go up some more. We'll go to 2s. We have one spin up, one spin down. And then we have 2p. So 2p, if we remember right, can have three total possible orbitals. That's because it has three different m sub l values associated with it, we know. So we have the 2p, and we have to hit four electrons here. So remember that first, when we're filling them, we fill them one in each orbital, all parallel, before we start pairing any together. And that gets us to three of the four. And then we have one left over. So we're going to put that into one of these other orbitals, paired going the opposite way. And so this is what our electron filling diagram orbital is going to be like for oxygen. Make sure that you write each of the eight electrons. You can also pay attention to whether a question asks you to do the full electron configuration or if it specifically tells you just to look at the valence electrons. If we've been asked just to draw the valence electrons, we only would have known to draw the 2s and 2p. That'll be especially common for our larger atoms where I may not want you to draw 50 different electrons, but instead just look at the valence. But make sure to pay attention to that. Or if for some reason you need to draw the core, remember that 1s in this case would be the core electrons. But for our larger atoms, it's going to be anything that occurs below the lowest principal quantum number. Remember, principal quantum number is going to be just this number up front. So our core is going to be everything in the ones that are below our highest number. And so this is going to be core. Whereas these, that both have two as their principal energy, quantum, principal quantum number, are going to be our valence. So now let's look at some more atoms where we're not going to draw a full picture of it but instead just write the electron configuration. So in this case, because it doesn't say write the full electron configuration, I'm fine if you use the noble gas notation. So we're gonna start with SE. If we find it, this atom has 34 electrons, 
We can note that because the atomic number is 34 and there's no charge on this atom, meaning that it's going to have the same number of electrons and protons. So if we find 34, we know that its noble gas that is closest to it is going to be argon. So this argon stands for the first 18 electrons in our system. And so then we just have to draw the valence afterwards. So we notice that we start in the N equals 4 energy level after we get by argon. So we're going to start with our 4s2 electrons. So 4s, and there are two of them. And we've got to draw a total of 16 more. So that's two of our 16 additional electrons that are valence, or that are after our argon. Then we have 10 here that are going to go to our 3d orbital. So we have 3d10, and then we that means we have four electrons left. So those are going to go in our 4p orbital, and we will have four of them there. So as a reminder, this would be perfectly fine as your answer right here. I'm going to draw a representation, though, of what the AR stands for, although you don't have to do this part unless you're specifically asked to draw the full electron configuration. So we write out all of it. We would get 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So this acts as a placeholder so that you don't have to write this out every single time. Now we have two more examples to look at. So we have chlorine. So for chlorine, its closest noble gas that comes before it is going to be neon. So that represents the first 10 electrons, so I only have to draw the remaining 7 because it has 17 total electrons. And it's going to start in the third period. So this will be the 3s2, 3p5 for our seven electrons. So that's going to be our answer for chlorine. And then we have titanium, Ti. Its noble gas is going to be argon. Again, similar to Se, we're at the same place. But now we have four electrons left to draw. So we're just going to have 4s2, 3d2. As a reminder also that while there are exceptions, to our rules sometimes about how exactly where our electrons get filled up for our um, transition metals. You're not going to worry about memorizing those for my course. I'm just worried that you're able to identify them if you're given the electron configuration. And we'll look at one of those examples on the next slide. So you don't have to worry about, wait, should it actually be 4s1, 3d3? Which, no, it shouldn't. 4s2, 3d2 is right here. But you don't have to worry about if you need to change that in some way. Just go with the orbital filling order that we're used to. If you don't remember how we got that, a quick refresher is that you can either look at your periodic table using the S, P, D, and F blocks and know that as you keep adding electrons in that area, you're adding, in the S block, you're adding based on the principal quantum number there. So for example, if you were at lithium, its last valence electron is going to be in the 2S orbital since it's in the S block and it is the first atom that appears in period two. So you can similarly do that for your P, P electrons as well. For example, carbon is two atoms into the P block. It comes after boron. So its last valence electron is going to be at 2p2 because it is in the second row and it is in the p block and it's two into it. You have to remember to include the previous electrons. In this case, since there are six, it would have already had the 1s2 and 2s2. And you can follow going across the periodic table to get your order. So it keeps going until you get to the d orbitals, which start at sc, our 21st, 21st electron in period four. With the d block, it's going to be in, you're going to use the letter 3d, that's because all the d orbitals are going to be higher in energy so that they don't get the same number as the period they're in. They get minus one. We get the same thing when you get to the f block, except that you add two to your system, or subtract two, sorry. So you will start with the 4f, even though it is in period six. So that's a way you can look at that to remember. The other thing we can do is we can write out this setup right here. So we have 1s, 2s, 2p, and what we're doing that should be a three, is we're writing out every possible orbital up to the f orbital for each of these. So we write this out first. So this is something if you had trouble remembering, I'm fine if you write it at the start of your exam, for example, to help you remember. 5f, 6s, 6p, 6d, 6f. And then we go down to period sevens, our last periods. So this is the last one we'll worry about. And what we want to do is we want to account for what order they fill in. We're going to draw arrows starting in the top right and going through. So we start with the 1s orbital. And initially it's just going to look like I'm going one at a time, like we go again here through the 2s orbital. But then this third line is going to go through the p and then the 3s, meaning our next order would be, so we follow these, we went 1s, 2s, 
And now we go 2P, 3S. And then we'll go through the next two. We go 3P, 4S. And then this next line goes through a D, so we go 3D, 4P, 5S. And we go again, we go 4D, 5P, 6S. I don't know why it zoomed in, but okay. I did not, it made my thing go away. Let's, there we go. Then we have to go through the 4F, 5D, 6P, 7S. Oh, it's because of that thing over there. And then finally, 5F, 6D, 7P. And we're through all the atoms we have to deal with on the periodic table. So if you have trouble remembering the order, another way is to draw this structure, do that same order, and that'll get it for you each time. So now we're going to look at some electron configurations where we're going the other way. This is the one where I'm actually going to give you the configuration. You have to figure out what it is. So for this first system, we have helium 2s2 2p1. So what we notice is helium represents two electrons and we have three more. So this is going to have a total of five electrons. And our system that has five electrons is going to be boron. Note that the reason I can do it this way is because we specifically say for the atom, which means the protons and electrons are the same. If it was an ion, you would have to keep that in mind as well. So let's go to this next one. What is the symbol for an atom and have the configuration Xe, 6s2, 4f4? So xenon is going to contain 54 electrons, and then we have to add our six more that occur after that. And when we do that, we're going to get towards 60 electrons. And when we look for that one, that actually occurs down in our F block, and we're going to get to neodymium, which is going to be represented by the symbol ND. And then finally, we have this last one here, which is argon 4S13D5. So argon has 18 electrons. This has six more. So we would have 24 electrons in this atom. And our system with 24 electrons is going to be chromium, which is represented as CR. Notice that this is an example of an exception. If I had asked you to draw the configuration for chromium, I would have been fine if you told me 4s2, 3d4, because I haven't asked you to memorize those exceptions. But sometimes you'll see them like this, and then I would expect you to identify that that's chromium and not manganese. So you should still be able to deal with that and remember that, hey, I have to pay attention to the numbers because one of these might not be full, even though it usually is. So make sure you pay attention to that when you're going through these. Okay, and that'll be the end of our work through chapter three. So for this chapter, focus on making sure you've got your periodic trends down. There will likely be a number of questions which are related to finding those periodic trends comparing two atoms. There will also probably be some definitional type questions like describing something as ionization energy and you having to pick out which definition works best for it or giving you the definition and having to pick which trend it is. And then make sure we can do our electron configurations, both the drawing version, like you saw here with oxygen, be able to draw that if you need to, where you put all these in the correct locations or just being able to draw the configurations, either like the one here where we have the double gas notation, or if you need to, being able to do the absolutely full notation that includes all the different electrons to, just to make sure you know what that stands for, and then be able to identify atoms based on what these configurations are for that. And if you can do all of those, you can do the grand majority of the work for chapter three.